We need to make the cost that people are paying reflect the true cost, the environmental cost, the social cost of what they're buying. We're just a tiny fraction of the world population, really. The richest, the most powerful, the most influential. We have a duty to worry about the people who don't have voices. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more. And My guest this week is Veronica bates Cassidy. Veronica is an economist and an independent analyst and consultant in sustainable fashion. Veronica was my source for a world-exclusive story that I published a couple of years ago about how stakeholders all across the fashion industry were colluding to promote polyester fiber as sustainable. Just around the time that the New York Fashion and Sustainability Act was being put forward, which had baked into the legislation questionable methodology that had been developed by the fashion industry itself. I invited Veronica on to discuss all of this and more. The updates in recent years with regards to these methodologies, how it is that fibres are analysed and designated as sustainable or not, and what the European Union is doing wrong with regards to drafting global legislation. This is a technical episode in the first half, with Veronica explaining what happens over the supply chains and how those impacts are measured. We also revealed the web of organisations and brands that have been working together to provide sustainability measurements and advice when they really have no place doing so. Finally, we discussed the economy and sustainability with regards to the majority world who are fundamental touchstones in the fashion supply chain and also who supply products to that chain in order to survive with veronica emphatically saying they need to be brought into the conversation to find out what they need and how it can be provided by the global community rather than alleged sustainable legislation threatening their very livelihoods i hope you all enjoy the episode if you do please share it far and wide and if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Veronica, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's very special for me to have you on the show. It's very kind of you. So we touched base. We got sort of uh, had a meeting a couple of years ago when I was investigating the fashion industry. And it's actually a, quite a brilliant little story that I'm going to tell, if I may. So I was looking to place this story on the corruption in the fashion industry and no major newspaper would take it because technically I didn't have proof in the case of somebody going on record and being like, yes, that's exactly what's happening. Um, but it was very obvious when you lined up all of the dots, essentially what was going on. And so I managed to get a piece of data journalism in The Guardian about the carbon disclosure project and how shocking it was um, that every single major brand whose gross emissions were increasing was getting this A rating from the Carbon Disclosure Project. And I asked the question, why, why is that? And I also pointed to the fact that there seemed to be some cross-pollination of board members between these organizations, these fashion sustainability NGOs and the big brands. Um, and then funnily enough, and I don't know if you know this, Funnily enough, I was, <laughs> I was single at the time and swiping on Hinge, the dating app, and I matched with a guy, I know, can you believe it? <laughs> I matched with a guy who worked in the fashion industry. Well, and he said, have you covered anything on fashion? And I said, actually, I had a piece come out this morning and I sent it to him. And he said, you need to speak to Veronica Bates Cassidy. She is the woman who knows absolutely everything about this. I've exchanged with her because I'm leaving the fashion industry because I'm really not happy with everything that's going on. Here's her email. And so that was how I managed to get in touch with you. Okay. And it was you that provided all of the documents, all of the data and all of the quotes that eventually got me this world exclusive in The Intercept. And we scooped the New York Times by four days, essentially. <laughs> 
on this big story about how the fashion industry was colluding essentially, you know, Essen oh, yeah, essentially with the oil and gas industry to rebrand polyester as sustainable because it was the cheapest fiber available. I have to say, I don't, I would not go quite so far as to say corruption and collusion. I'm more, <laughs> I would say it's business. What you can do, what the economics incentivize and what the law permits is what is going to happen. And when you look at the fact that polyester is 50 cents a pound, and if you look at uh, cotton, we're near a one, over a dollar a pound. Look at um, wool, you're even higher, seven, eight. Silk, you know, you're getting into the $60. <laughs> you, know, you don't really want to have studies saying, well, these are really sustainable fabrics and everyone should use these, do you? Because you're not going to be able to sell large volumes. So you have no incentive to do, to head in that direction, to look at the favorable idea, you know, evaluations for these fibers. You have every incentive to go and look for a study that shows you that polyester is a sustainable fiber. And when I first fell into the industry back in, in sort of 2019, that, that was everywhere. Everyone was saying, oh, polyester is a more sustainable fiber. And we had the global fashion agenda, which is a grouping of lots of the big brands um, saying, yeah, we want to substitute 30% uh, of our cotton with polyester by 2030. Now, they've never retracted that. I don't know whether they're still trying to do it. I kind of doubt it. But everyone, you know, the, the oil industry was happy to provide LCAs. Plastics Europe had a lovely LCA, best, best practice production of PET in Europe. And everyone was using that and claiming this represents global production, which it doesn't remotely. But nobody had an incentive to go off and get a full LCA of global production of polyester, you know, and, and PET, most of which comes from China, because it wasn't going to give you nearly such nice results as the, 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 the one from uh, Plastic Europe. And since the EU was letting people use this, you know, the EU has been setting up its press and they were perfectly happy for it. Why would any brand go and, you know, cut off its nose and, 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 and do something different? You know, it's like there's a whole ecosystem out there. And, I, you know, I don't, I'm no fan of, <laughs> you know, the big brands, but I think we have to be reasonable about this. They have, I mean, if you notice that Nike, Nike shareholders voted against a bunch of stuff this morning, you know, these these big brands, now we're not talking about Patagonia, we're not talking about bestseller because they are privately held. They can do whatever they like. And so I feel they have a greater responsibility than the other brands, but the ones like H&M, um, oh, CNA is also privately held. H&M, uh, you know, Nike, all of these, they're, they're public companies, they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders, which is we've got to, we cannot do anything. We cannot spend your money on anything. That includes LCAs that are not going to benefit you financially further down the line. So, you know, we have to be realistic about this and there's no point in expecting, I think this is the big failure, we've been allowing the industry to claim to be regulating itself. And the EU has literally gone so far as to quite literally incorporate the industry's notions of sustainability into, uh, you know, uh, forthcoming regulations, which I think people need to really be aware of and need to yeah. be, be quite active about because it's not... It doesn't represent reality at all. It represents, you know, what, what's incentivized and uh, yeah, yeah, problematic. It, deeply. I think let's, let's go back in time a little bit. Um, and I think painting a picture of how these organizations came into existence, this network that you're discussing would be helpful. Um, and also for people listening, LCA is a life cycle analysis. So that essentially, um, analyzes the impact of a certain material from its um, inception, from the moment it's kind of taken out of the ground or whatever, to the moment that normally, to the moment that it is um, destroyed. So that's called cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back in time to about 2009, 2010, I think it was 2009, when Patagonia and Walmart of all companies got together and decided, you know, we should do something about sustainability. At least that was kind of the line that was used. Um, and they wrote this big letter to a whole bunch of CEOs of uh, retail companies. And from that uh, initiative, they created the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which went on to essentially help spawn a whole bunch of other organizations, including um, HIG. And HIG was a private company that was um, registered under the jurisdiction of Delaware, which is the state that is notorious for its lack of transparency. You can't get any information 
uh, for a company that's registered in Delaware, even though the headquarters were in California. Um, and this private company created the HIG MSI, the HIG Material Sustainability Index. Correction here, the Sustainable Please. Apparel Coalition, Coalition created the HIG MSI. Right. We then spun it out to HIGCO some years down the right. road. When did that happen? 2019, something like this, 2020. Right. They spun it out to this private um, public benefit corporation, I think it's called, registered in Delaware. As you say, good luck finding anything about it. It is mm. not obliged to demonstrate that it actually contributed to the public benefit in any public document. And it had a lot of venture capital funding. I think the first mm -hmm. round, it's not quite clear how much they got, probably somewhere around 30 million. The second round, we know they got 50 million. So there's a lot of millions riding mm -hmm. on this uh, company, which was called Higco and is now called What's it called? World. Worldly. Worldly. Mm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it owns the suite of HIG uh, instruments, of which I think there are five. The only one that you as a common mortal can go and take a look at is the MSI if you register on the website. So that's the only one I ever talk about. When I talk about the HIG, I'm always talking about the HIG MSI. Mm -hmm. But they have other ones. They have a brand and retail module. They have a something else and something else. And some of these, I'm told, are better and are more factual and more accurate. I don't know. Um, they may well be. But the MSI, I mean, it's amazing that they got so much money given the the MSI wasn't actually doing any primary research. They were essentially cherry picking studies in order to, as you're saying, create the results that were beneficial to the people that were funding it, to the stakeholders and the, the shareholders in the fashion industry. Mm. And so you mentioned plastics. And this was quite an astonishing one. You know, they used this plastics life cycle analysis from Plastics Europe, so that's a company that's based in Europe, to kind of create this score about the sustainability of plastic, even though 92% of polyester production is in Asia. That's where the vast, vast, vast majority of fashion's clothes come from. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, a misnomer, essentially, to cast that study as representative of the global impact of polyester. And yet that's what they did. And nobody was pulling them up on any of this. I mean, it was astonishing Rachel, how it just kind of... Aren't. There still is no global polyester LCA. Nobody is commissioning one. Plastics Europe is, is like a federation <clears throat> of all the uh, plastics producers. So it's in, in Europe and including the UK and the others. So obviously they've got their own data. They represent their own best practice. You know, <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing business too. And, um, but yes, you know, the people who I think really we have the European Union is planning this raft of green legislation. Uh, tackling the fashion industry seems to be a priority for them. And it's got, we had the product environmental footprint that seems now no longer, it's been through this like three regulatory phases it goes to, it's been through two of them. And at the, it's not obligatory at the moment. But all the millions, the tens of millions that have been spent on developing the PEF, you know, it's all still ongoing. Well, and can you, what is the PEF? Product environmental footprint. So basically, environmental footprint. getting your LCA and kind of working out what are the impacts in the different areas. It's, I mean, in a way, the HIG MSI is a product environmental footprint, but the HIG MSI only does five variables. So it looks at, um, you know, carbon emissions. It looks at water consumption. It looks at, uh, it doesn't use land use. I think it does uh, toxicity. Uh, anyway, something else. Whereas, uh, whereas a PIF has 16 variables. And so you're getting information for every fiber of these 16 variables, and then you put them together into a number, um, which comes out the other end. And how you do this, obviously, you weight it. So, <laughs> we're just all getting very complex. Anyway, the, 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 the EU spent a lot of money on developing the PEF, consulted lots of LCA providers, and the model itself, I understand, is very sophisticated. But the one question nobody seems to have asked themselves is where are we going to get the data that's going to feed into this model? Because obviously mm -hmm. any model in the world, no matter how beautiful, is no better than its base data, garbage in, mm. garbage out. So the EU doesn't seem to have spent any money at all that I can discern on LCAs of base data. So there is no LCA of global polyester. And mm. the other thing to point out is LCA is only valid for quite a short period of time. Mm. Because by the time you've got the data, generally it's like you know, global data one, two years after the, that it took place. You've got to collect all the data, then you've got to make your study another year, and then you publish it. So, you know, really an LCA is only good for about six years. Now, all the LCAs out there are much older than six years, all the ones that they're using. I mean, it really is, there is time, there is a need to do new LCAs, but who's going to pay for them? Well, hmm. you know, 
the people with the big money, um, the big brands, well, they're not going to spend, indeed, arguably, they can't spend money on doing, on doing LCAs, which are not going to help their business model. So uh, I really feel very much that this is, this is the EU's responsibility. If the EU wishes to have green legislation, which has extraterritorial uh, applicability, and it does, what they're doing is going to affect global trade flows, they have a, a, a moral responsibility, not to mention a scientific responsibility, to get valid data. And for that, they're going to need an LCA, an up-to-date LCA of absolutely everything. Because I mean, even the, the, con the conventional cotton one that everyone uses, which was done by uh, Cotton Incorporated, funded by Cotton Incorporated, uh, undertaken by a big LCA company called Sfera. Um, it's, I think, 2016. So that's no longer valid. We're 2024. The organic cotton, which everyone misinterpreted anyway to make all these claims about organic cotton that weren't true, that's 2014. That's long gone, you know? So, and then the Plastics Europe one, I think, is 2000. And 15? I'm not quite sure, maybe 13 or 15. So again, and I haven't seen a new one. There should be a new one out by now. There isn't. So now, because you know, if we want to look for reasons why they wouldn't be, well, we can consider the huge uh, increase in, in the emissions associated with extraction uh, based not only on the fact that now we have so much fracking, but also um, apparently now they've started to capture the fugitive emissions. And I was reading something. I don't have all of this data is kept in these big databases, echo mm -hmm. things, and you have to, they're behind paywalls. So you and I can't see. But there was an interesting post on LinkedIn by a chap called, uh, who's, who worked for a big company called Unomia. And he was saying that the latest data that came out has increased the emissions from some areas by 35. So you can see that if they do another LCA today, even if they do one for Europe, it's going to come with a much higher uh, uh, emission tag than the old version. So obviously nobody has mm -hmm. an incentive to do a new one. And, um, you know, that's, as I said, <laughs> if the economics incentivize it and the law permits it, that's what will happen. So unless the EU pulls its finger out and says, okay, we're going to do a proper LCA of all these fibers, they really have no, no basis um, for, for much of their green regulation. I think this is what is so frightening and interesting about this story and it serves as a really excellent example of how just because something is being put forward as regulation or law it does not mean that it's actually the right thing to do it does not mean that it's getting the correct data because the fashion industry serves as an example of an industry that just tried to get the jump on sustainability by becoming the very thing that will regulate itself and thus managed to regulate itself in a way that was profitable so, I mean, when we spoke for the article that I published on The Intercept a few years ago, you know, we were, there was an urgency to the research, to the investigation, because the Hague MSI was about to get written into law in, the, in New York. There was a New York Fashion Sustainability Act. And, you know, it was heralded as, as this really progressive thing. It was going to be quite amazing what they were seeking uh, companies to be responsible for. And yet, because it was all based around the MSI, the MSI rankings and the MSI data, what you and a few other analysts in the industry were saying was that this is not going to be good enough. In fact, I think I have a quote from you saying, you know, if the fashion industry were to write its own laws them very selves, this is the exact thing that they would come up with, essentially, Perhaps because it benefits them. I think we should just get one fact straight. They mm. does not require you to use the MSI. In, it, it requires you, the, the New York Fashion Act, which is still on the books, it apparently progressed through, the, um, through some stages in, in the New York State uh, Senate, um, Congress, I don't know how these things work, but anyway, it, ma it made some progress during the last year, but now it'll have to wait again until the next, you know, the next, after the next elections. Um, they specify a science-based target initiative. Now, if you go to the science-based target initiative, a document on how you could, should calculate your science-based uh, target emissions for the apparel industry, it suggests that if you don't have primary data and you can just go and look at any textile exchange study to see that the, um, the big brands do not have primary data on their material, on their fabric. Most of them don't even know which country it came from. So if you don't have primary data, it says you may use the Hig MSI. You don't have to use the Hig MSI. But mm -hmm. again, this is business. They're already using the Hig MSI. You know, H&M and people, they're all members of, of, of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. They're all using the Hague MSI. Why would you spend money 
going off and looking for an alternative method, which may or may not be acceptable, you're going to use the Higgins MSI. And um, incidentally, I uh, was, was along with a chap called Terry Townsend, we were commissioned to do some work for the World Bank um, earlier this year, and we wanted to check uh, what they were using. So we wrote to H&M and we said, okay, fine, you know, how are you calculating? Because H&M was recently heralded as being like, you know, a leading, a leading uh, brand when it comes to science-based targets, commitments, and, you know, nobody else is doing as much work as they are, and all of which is shit. So I uh, asked them how they calculate. And they replied very politely and very promptly, they use the HIG MSI. They don't have, um, you know, like proprietary, uh, you know, some obviously included in the Higgins MSI, you have some proprietary numbers. So if you are a particular you know, lensing, uh, whatever type of li lio cell, or whatever that's in there, and if they, they use that one, and if not, they use a generic one. She was totally candid and totally honest. And so obviously what this means is that they are claiming that because they switched out uh, organic cotton, or rather they switched out conventional cotton, brought in organic cotton, they got a huge reduction in emissions. I think I have a little chart here. Okay, yes. So this, this is the worldly Hig MSI global warming normalized scores, okay, because the Hig MSI normalizes by process and the numbers it comes up with are not like, you know, ton emissions, carbon emissions per kilo, they're, they're like Higgies per kilo, should we say. So <laughs> as a for raw material, but for conventional cotton, it's 2.63. For polyester, it's 2.73. So a lot of people say, oh, you see, that means that it doesn't say that uh, synthetics are more sustainable than cotton. Well, strictly, when it just comes to carbon emissions, it doesn't. But when you consider that that's, I don't know what percentage difference is at, 6%, I know something really low. And, and <laughs> for a fabric that costs uh, twice as much, you know, it really is not in your incentive, in your interest to, to switch in cotton instead of polyester, is it? you'd be better switching to uh, organic cotton, which has an impact of only 1.37, according to them. Now, we know that's not true. We know that organic cotton actually has a higher impact than conventional cotton, and that's just- Why is that? Because um, you get uh, generally a lower yield, and because most, they're not using um, synthetic fertilizers, most of them will be using manure, particularly since most organic cotton comes from India. And uh, just as we talk about livestock emissions and the big problems, manure uh, has big emissions. And so um, the actual LCA that they did of organic cotton back in 2014 had a nice little chart and showed that if they had included the manure emissions, chung, way past conventional oh, cotton. So uh, when they substitute organic for conventional, in reality, H&M is not reducing its emissions at all. It is increasing them. Um, the next one, the other one, if you use recycled cotton, well, that's great. Apparently, it's only 0.35, may or may not be. Polyester, on the other hand, if you go from conventional polyester, virgin polyester, it's 2.73. Swip in, uh, uh, there's different types of recycled polyester. So I just made an average, um, and it was just a numerical average because I don't know which is, is more important in terms of global production. If you, It's just 1.43. So you go from 2.73 down to 1.43 if you use recycled polyester. Again, that's not true. Recycled polyester actually has much higher impact than conventional virgin polyester uh, for two reasons. First of all, because the, the studies that show that it's lower in a processing uh, context are based on um, uh, lab results, if you will, and apparently from talking to somebody in the... Um, in the polyester sector, they because of the impurities, they actually heat it much higher than that. And so it doesn't have lower emissions. But more to the point, when you have a plastic bottle, you can recycle it as many times uh, as you like indefinitely. I think actually it's 10 times with the addition of a little but It can be recycled many, many times. When people talk about recycled polyester, they are almost invariably talking about recycled plastic bottle PET made into polyester. So it's not the polyester fabric that's being recycled at all. It's a bottle that is being pulled out of the, uh, the bottle cycle and being put into the fabric cycle where it will be used exactly once and thrown away. So mm. you, you need to add the cost of producing the new bottle to replace the one that you took away. Well, obviously at that point, your recycled polyester is considerably higher environmental impact than not using recycled polyester if you're getting it from a bottle. 
Now, the day they start to use recycled fabric, which everyone has been saying is coming, and they've been saying it's coming since 2005, when actually they did. Patagonia used to make stuff out of recycled fiber to fiber recycled polyester, but it became too cheap. You know, the, it's, the polyester is so cheap at 50 cents a pound. How are we going to collect all this polyester clothing, sort it in all these different colors, turn it into new polyester, all for 50 cents a pound? I mean, that is a big ask, which is why many people, myself included, uh, think that there should be a levy on, on um, polyester, on virgin polyester, so that to the extent that we believe polyester should be recycled and polyester should be used at all, which is a whole different question if we're worrying about the impact of plastics on the human body and on, ecology, on, on the environment. And every week, there seems to be a new study with some petrifying founded on that, finding on that count. So, I mean, there's a very, a very good case, a very sound case, I think, for actually putting an environmental levy on polyester to discourage the use of polyester completely, certainly in non-essential uses, because... It is a very real health risk, and it's not proven. Lots of people often say, "Oh, it's not." No, it's not proven. I agree, it's not proven. Uh, but whereas it used to be very much um, labs, it had shown, you know, uh, studies in laboratories had shown this was having it. But they're now finding they found, uh, you know, little plastic um, nanoparticles in absolutely everything from placenta to best breast milk to feces to, to you know, penile tissue in people who had erectile dysfunction. I mean, it's just every, every in the brain, every, every month there's a new study that comes out and it's very, very worrying. So I personally, personal decision, I try to use this little, this little plastic and it's not just clothing. I try to not use plastic. I'm trying to get the plastic out of my kitchen the plastic, because, I mean, I'm old, so it doesn't really matter. But if you're young, I would strongly recommend that you exercise the precautionary principle and, and, and try to minimize the use of plastic. But, you know, putting all that to one side and assuming that we do want to recycle polyester, then um, yeah, it needs to be genuine fabric to fabric recycling, not this, this plastic bottle nonsense. Yeah, I remember uh, in our meeting over coffee in London when you you told me that, and it and it blew my mind. And also, I think you told me that um, even sort of secondhand fashion, uh, when you take a sort of system systemic analysis of it, it really actually doesn't do anything very much to um, our sort of environmental impact either. Because the point is, we're still just getting buying more and more and more. Um, and so I think it would be good to understand. I mean, is there a way for fashion to become sustainable or are we like every other industry looking at it has to be absolute reductions in um, production consumption in order to decrease the impact on the planet because it is the second most polluting industry Who knows? in the world. Uh, back back to what I was saying, we don't know that. That's not that's not a given at all. Um, there was some nonsense about it, you, you know, the water, the emissions, and that actually came from some study. Potentially, actually, it came from a from a a, a publicity done by um, a company that wanted to sell polyester as more sustainable, and so they made all these blog posts back in two thousand and nine, as I recollect. So yeah, I mean, as I said, mm. try not to look at these big numbers. The point is, I feel with clothing, is a lot of it is not essential. You know, like much of what we use plastics for, healthcare. Um, keeping planes light, keeping uh, vehicles light, you know, it's its very difficult to start replacing plastic. But, but a linen look dress, a silk look dress, you can replace that with a genuine item tomorrow. So when, when it comes to making fashion more sustainable, the big volumes are in the cheap items or in the polyesters. That's what encourages people to, to buy so much. I and mean, you can buy a polyester dress from Shein for five pounds. Well, obviously, you're going to have no compunction about throwing out a five pound dress. You'd have a lot mm. more compunction about throwing out a 500 pound dress or a 5,000 pound dress. So as long as fashion remains really cheap, it's going to be very difficult to stop people. And we live in a democracy. We live in a free society. You know, people are free to spend their carbon budget on what they want to spend it on. And if they want to spend it on fashion, well, that's fine. But we need to make the cost that people are paying reflect the true cost, the environmental cost, the social cost of what they're buying. And then they're guided to do, to make the right decision. Now, one very important thing about fashion, you were saying, can it be sustainable? Well, cotton, for instance, cotton is, um, it's the lifeblood, it's the cash crop of some of the poorest people on the planet. It's Benin's principal export. It's what Benin pays for 
it's all its imports and Benjamin's principal import is rice. So, uh, you know, it, the cotton plays a, a big role in seeding the world. And obviously it's only, it's only in the ground six months or something else in the ground for the other six months, which will be a food crop generally. It's not like, and, and, and it's grown in rotation. But just the, you need a cash crop. Even if you want, you know, you're the poorest on the planet, you need a cash crop. And these people have emissions that are well below the two to 2.5 tons that we're all allowed. So if you're buying cotton grown by somebody on the poorest, you know, one of the poorest people on the planet, then you're doing something sustainable and that you're helping to lift these people up. You're helping with the SDGs one and two, et cetera. Not so obviously if you're buying polyester, you know, richest people in the planet make polyester, so we definitely don't need to help them. If you buy an item of clothing and you wear it a thousand times, say, then your impact per wear will be really quite low and you will not be generating the huge waste. So if what we really, to, could fashion be more sustainable? Yes, it could be. Fashion could do a lot of good work. If fashion stopped for using so much polyester, which would automatically cut down the volume without anybody having to say anything to anybody about degrowth because suddenly it's going to become much more expensive and we know, you know, downward sloping demand curves, people are going to buy less. People are going to throw out less. We're going to help with the waste problem. And, uh, you know, there's, there's another thing, obviously, is as everyone talks about the fact that the workers aren't paid enough. Now, if they were paid enough, uh, if they were paid a living wage, the price of flesh would go up, but again, reduce the amount that people buy naturally. One of the big problems with fashion is, or with fabrics rather, is that maybe 12% of the emissions are uh, of lifetime emissions are in the raw material, about 20% of the, manuf of the production emissions. The big chunk of producing your fabric, the big energy emissions come in the spinning, weaving, knitting, dyeing, finishing. Now, all of that at the moment, certainly in cheap fashioning, is happening in countries with very high carbon emissions associated with the energy mix. Um, you know, India, China. Now, obviously, if you either switch to a country that has a much lower um, energy, uh, you know, an, an energy mix with much lower carbon emissions associated with it, France, for instance, or, or Italy, um, you would automatically reduce uh, apparel's uh, emissions. Much more expensive. <laughs> so, or alternatively, if you kept on in India, in, in China, in Sri Lanka, and you installed lots of uh, carbon mitigating uh, technology, you would... Trees. Sorry? They have trees. trees. <laughs> is that true? But I mean, like, they have all kinds of equipment now which you can stick in your factory that will reduce um, uh, your, your energy. It's not just you need to put some solar panels. There's lots of things you can put uh, in, in, in factories. I'm not an engineer, so I'm not going to start listing them, but I know there are, uh, that will greatly reduce your uh, emissions impact. They cost money. Well, if nobody's willing to pay for them, they're not going to be installed. And so that's, you know, all of these things could be done that would uh, already, you, you, <laughs> shoot, if you reduce drastically the emissions of spinning, knitting, weaving, even if you carried on consuming as much, you would reduce uh, the emission contribution of fashion. Now you still have the waste problem, um, which is another issue, and that's another polluting problem. So do we have to say you have to consume less? I think... I mean, we all have to consume less. Let's face it. If you're, if you're British, if you're European, you're probably on six or seven tons per annum in your consumption emissions. If you're Indian or Sub-Saharan African, you're below, well below two. I mean, you're below one, I think, if you're in. So you don't have to reduce your emissions. You live in, if you're a farmer in, 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 in Benin or, or Zambia or most of India, you, know, you don't have to reduce your emissions at all. On the contrary, you have to increase them. Because otherwise, we are never going to satisfy the SDGs. These people have to consume more. They have to be, have access to many of the things that we have that they don't have. It's us. We've got to do something. And we can't keep consuming at the rate at which we're consuming because we, can't, we don't have seven tons per person to, to, to emit. So how do, we do, how do we get down this? What you have to look at it as an individual is that you personally have to think, what do I want to spend my carbon budget on? If you want to buy fashion sustainably, you need to worry about one thing only, and that is how many times am I going to wear this? We should not be carried away too much by people telling us numbers. We should not be seduced by people saying, oh, this has more impact than that, has less impact, because these numbers are questionable. 
and uh, different assumptions, different years, different boundaries, different methodologies will all give you different numbers. I mean, it's almost like common sense, isn't it? You know, <laughs> what is the problem? We're over-consuming, you know? We look, we've over-consumed in absolutely everything. We've over-dumped rubbish. We've got rubbish everywhere. We don't know what to do with it. So what, <laughs> what does common sense tell you? Well, buy a little less and dump a little less and you know, <laughs> you're already, you know, on, on, on the right road. I want to go back to the EU regulations and what you said about this social aspect as well, yeah. uh, which I think is really critical. The, the fact that, you know, some of the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world uh, essentially depend on this part of the fashion supply chain or supplying products to that supply chain. Yeah. Um, because something that I was really astounded by in the report that you sent me um, was that, now correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like the EU is not taking into consideration the, the so, certain social aspects when it's actually trying to calculate sustainability of these fibers. Are you talking about the ESPR report? Is that Yes. The, yes. Which I think I've got, I've got the summary here. If anyone wants to go and look at it, it's online <laughs> on the <laughs> Cotton Research and Development Corporation website. You can check all this stuff for yourself. Yeah. Uh, certainly for the uh, ESPR, it specifically states Sustainable does not include the social aspect. And you look at the um, product environmental footprint that people were supposed to be advised to choose their clothing based on sustainability, not in it. Look at the Higgem SI. The, the sustainability in, in terms of, of uh, social impact is not in it. And obviously, we've made all these commitments. We have told the world, we've signed up to the SDGs, you know, for 2030, we said, yes, we're going to help you. And we, every cop you go to, well, I haven't been to any of them, but every cop that you read, <laughs> should have a report on, runs up there saying, yeah, we're going to have climate change and climate justice, and we'll worry about you, and we're going to do something for you. And then when they go home and they write the regulations, there is no social impact anywhere to be seen. I mean, it's just, it's not there. And they, um, they have various regulations like, the uh, CS3D, which is called the Social Due Diligence Directive, which tells you that you're supposed to worry about these things. But then they start telling you have to worry about water consumption. And then you get to, you look at caring the PL, and caring the PL says that um, farming cotton in, 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 in sort of Cote uh, d'Ivoire in Zimbabwe and people is, is, is terrible because it consumes so much water. Well, it doesn't, it's rain fed. But, you know, when you start, because there's this, and one of the things people get quite keen on is, is how much water consumption uh, goes into many of these crops and uh, they weight it. So when you, when you talk about water consumption, it's very rare that certainly in the Higa MSI or the PEC, when they give you the numbers, they're giving you the actual value of the water that was consumed. They're not. They're giving you a weighted value, which means that they have decided that water is a big problem, water scarcity is a big problem, and they're weighting, the, they're multiplying the amount of milk, uh, water that was consumed to produce the milk or to produce the cotton or to produce the uh, silk, or whatever it is, they're, they're multiplying this by a factor, a number, that they feel represents the scarcity of the water in that particular location. What? Yeah. And it's called AWARE. The system they use is called AWARE. Now, uh, if you go to, what study was it? Ah, amplifying misinformation. You can also, if anyone wants to find links to any of this stuff, you can just go to my website, veronicabateskasatli.com, and all the links are there. So there's a water scarcity footprint in Australia where you can't really see. But <laughs> you're <laughs> aware, okay, I think it, the, the average um, consumption of, of uh, water varied from 9.1 to 313 litres per litre of milk, okay? What did wow. AWARE say it was by the time they'd multiplied this 9.1 to 300, so somewhere around 160? What did, what did, do you want to guess? What aware said it was. It's very amusing. Uh, what the, the, the we turn 160 uh, liters of water per liter of milk. What does do, what do you think aware turns it into? How many liters do you think aware? Oh is? no! I mean, it would be absurd to be. I mean, it would be absurd to be below 160, wouldn't it? But uh, I don't know, 100. No, no. It's making it higher. It's saying that a lot of water was consumed. Okay, so this is a point of the water scarcity. They say, oh, the water here is is scarce. So we multiply it by something so that you think, and this is what happens with all the cotton. So it looks like your cotton is consuming a lot of water because we're taking the water that was actually consumed and we're multiplying it by something. We're saying, oh, water is scarce in Benin. So we have to multiply the water that they used on the cotton by a value. So I'll tell you the answer. This is Australian. <laughs> this is Australian. I think it was West Australia. Yeah. Uh, using AWARE, 
the 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 average uh, went up from somewhere around 160 to 6,660. Oh, uh, but I uh, but I don't understand. Why would that be beneficial to them in any way to make it look worse? No, it's not beneficial to the farmers at all. If you want to use plastic, it's certainly beneficial to you. But this was oh, I see. This is, I mean, this to be fair to aware, aware is a a water a scarcity weighting that was devised by a group of LCA providers and by um, oh good. Unilever and some others. And uh-huh. they, they now, you know, various people have come and said, uh, you know, I, th- I don't think they were trying to do anything. I genuinely don't. I think they were just trying to make a water scarcity index with, you know, these LCA providers. They don't know anything about farming. They don't know anything about hydrology. They don't know, you know, they're just trying to get in numbers and putting them together to try and get some kind of indicator of hotspots, which is what LCAs were originally intended for, by the way. They were not intended to start telling consumers what to buy. They were intended to enable companies and producers and manufacturers to identify areas in their production that were uh, not, you know, were, were, were harmful and that could be targeted and worked upon and ameliorated. So that, I think, is what the aware people were trying to do. I don't know for sure, but I think that's what they were trying to do. So other people have brought out other indices, other weighting cysts since, but the EU uses aware and the HIGNSI uses aware. Now, if we go to the same Australian study, if they use WSI, WHEQ, one of the, it's only 18 liters. So that one, they come up with something lower. Mm. They say because mm. Australian water is actually very carefully regulated, um, you, it's only 18. It's not actually scarce at all. That's, it's, that's an impossible range, 18 impossible, to 6,000. Impossible. From 18 to 6,660. I mean, this is when people give you numbers. What number are you giving me and where did you get it from? Mm. Because mm. one, and this, they're all equally valid, okay? In terms of science, in terms of ISO standards, these are all valid. But they're coming up with hugely different outcomes depending on which model you use, which is that. So here, this is just a water weighting, which water weighting you want to use. Now, a lot of people in the LCA industry don't like aware. They think it's not, um, not an LCA specialist, but they don't think it's, it's a good one. And they think that, and other people say, that doesn't actually, that doesn't actually reflect the way LCA is supposed to work, which is one issue. And then there are others who say that, well, actually, you know, the the, the scarcity weightings that they're putting in, um, you know, that they're, they're not factually. And we know from climate change that what, who has water and who doesn't have water is changing. So, oh, of course, you know. Um, so, and it's and, mm, sorry, sorry, but is I mean, you know, I assume as well that. Um, whatever is sourced from Australia is going to be more expensive than what is sourced from Asia. Well, so, I mean, who does this harm? That Like having a range that wide. Think this was intended to harm anybody. People are just... No, but there are always second and third and fourth order effects. So I of assume there are, will. But I don't know that that was the intent, as I say. I think they just... Sure. That, that when they started, this is what they were doing. Now, I think that, again, I go back to the EU. I think the EU has a responsibility to consult with the world as a whole before it starts flopping out its legislation. You know, do we think AWARE is the right water weighting mm. system? Should we be weighting water at all? I mean, these are questions because if you look at the, um, you know, the Declaration of Human Rights, you'll find that it states quite clearly that a country's natural resources, so its land, its water, its own business. So what right does the EU to start coming uh, and saying, oh, it's scarce, so we're not, we think your product isn't good. Does it have a right to do that? Mm. I would question that. Should it just, I personally think for water, you should just stick to the actual water that was consumed. You should not start weighting it. Um, and they do the same with land. They weight land by land use by Lanka. I have no idea how Lanka works. But basically, it seems to be that the more extensive the production, i.e. the poorer the soil, the poor, the harsher the climate, <laughs> the less sustainable it is. Because you need, this is ridiculous. But, but that seems to be how it works out, that because you need more land. Uh, per per kilo of fiber or meat or whatever it is you're producing. So again, I think the EU has a real responsibility before it reels out all this legislation to consult, not just with a bunch of LCA providers, but with the countries who are going to be impacted by all this, by us, you know, common citizens who are going to be impacted by all this. Before you tell us all of this, do you not want to tell us what you're weighting it by and why you're weighting it? Do you not want to tell us that some people are saying this is really a bad system, you know? And again, you know, if, if calculating carbon emissions, when it comes to calculating carbon emissions on a farm, 
it's very difficult. And there are a multitude of different ways you can do this. There's, I mean, uh, Cotton Trust Protocol first uses 40. You have a choice of 40 different ways. DEFRA did a study of just six different ways across models of, of 20 different model farms. And they found huge differences in the lowest to the highest. So, you know, before we start making laws, rules, regulations, interfering in global trade, changing global trade, Somebody needs to discuss all of this. There needs to be a proper discussion rather than us just the EU sitting there like Lord Almighty and rolling out legislation uh, to uh, which, which impacts the global south without consulting them at all and without even consulting basically the scientific community. Because when we're looking at these, as I say, and where it's some LCA providers and Unilever, that's not the scientific community as a whole. I'm sure they're excellent LCA providers. I'm sure their, their intention was the very best. But they don't have the, the knowledge of agriculture, of um, you know, hydrology, of, or any of this to actually judge. Similarly with the land use, I think that will soon be the thing of LCA providers. You know, it, they, it, they have to pull this out of the domain of LCA providers and put it out into the global scientific community and into um, the, the, the global community. We, you know, if they want to give us legislation, they need to be able to tell us that this legislation is not going to have any harmful side effects, that it's considering all the important variables, um, and that it's based on the very best that science has to offer. And if science doesn't have enough to offer, then don't start making complicated legislation. Go for something really simple, like a tax, an environmental levy on uh, plastics, on polyester production, because, you know, that's incontrovertible. That is standard. You know, I was brought, I, when I went to NSC, it was, it was, it was um, you know, a free market. It was Friedman Economics. It was Chicago School Economics that we were taught. And uh, so that, that, you know, applies to everybody across the spectrum from, from Republicans through Democrats. Everybody's agreed on the same thing. That if you want efficient allocation of resources, you have to internalize any externalities. Now, there are huge externalities associated with fashion. Uh, we've already discussed some of them, from the plastics to the wages not paid properly to the effluent that isn't treated. Internalize all of these, i.e. make the consumer aware of these in the price that they pay for their clothing. Price is obviously going to soar. People will consume much more responsibly. Mm. I mean, obviously, I'm an economist. I think economics works. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, we work. We work on, on economic management. You know, when we talk about value, we generally think about money. So... You know, if we want people to buy their clothes, <laughs> not like yeah, marketing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, I don't think anybody's ever come on and um, you know spoken well of Friedman economics before <laughs> on the show. So that's well, a... <laughs> well you know, uh, he he was very Friedman would have heartily disapproved of all this CSR mm. nonsense. It would have been he would have been appalled at. Um, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition being handed a uh, carte blanche by the EU appalled. He must be rolling in his grave because he was very firm that businessmen know about business and know about making money. They don't know about the social welfare, the social good. You can read the, what they refer to as the Friedman Doctrine, which is actually just a quick thing in the New York Times. It's very short. And he says they don't know. And he says also, very pointedly, that it's not for them to decide. It is for the elected representatives of the people to decide. Now, obviously, he was writing at a time during the Cold War, he was particularly concerned. He was already old at that time. He'd been through, you know, the Communist Revolution, the Chinese, a uh, great leap forward, Cultural Revolution. He was very anti-communist. So that did color the way, his phraseology and the way that he presented his arguments. But his argument, I think, it applies just as much today. What does, what, what do Patagonia, Nike, et cetera, et cetera, know about sustainability? What does H&M know about it? Nothing. So why are they the ones deciding? Why is the EU's technical secretariat from the PEF a pay-to-play model in which the, you, the voting seats are bought? I mean, mm. this is democratic. I mean, it's, it's not in my book. Um, and if you want to do, if you want your legislation, particularly if the EU wants its legislation to apply outside Europe, which it does, when you look at EUDR, it already is entirely outside Europe pretty much. It's putting its big hand out there. Um, it really has a duty to, to, to consider everybody 
who its impact its its legislation is going to impact, and it has a duty to include everybody in the conversation, not just. I mean, you understand the logic. The EU believes that it's much easier to get legislation through if the corporations you're going to legislate support it, which is perfectly true. But that doesn't mean that you give them to make it you. right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Everybody deserves a say. Brands deserve a say. It has to be feasible for them. It has to be doable, you know. And if we, if it's not going to be doable, then there has to be some change in the legislation so that they, 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 they are protected uh, financially in the sense that, you know, like a levy on polyester, then it's a, le- a level playing field. Everyone has got to adhere to, to, to that. Whereas if you start saying, oh, you must do something, and farmers are always complaining about this. We keep saying to farmers, oh, you must use less of this and you must do more of that. You must sequester the other. And then <laughs> there's no money comes in with it. You know, we just expect them to shoulder the responsibility. And I think we have to look at who's going to shoulder the responsibility for these sorts of things, who's going to pay for it. And obviously, if we want people to consume less and we must consume less, or we're going to keep on pushing um, emissions, the best way to do that is to make us pay for for what the problems we're causing. And then we'll consume mm. wisely. There's no, you know, no, sticking all these little bits of legislation on the end and say we're going to have eco-design product responsibility and we're going to increase longevity. It's not going to help if people still throw the garment out, even though it's still perfectly good, which they're doing already because it's so cheap. You know, we have to, you have to look at the whole picture. I, I agree. And I think the whole picture as well includes what you were discussing at the beginning, which is this, you know, the incentive. And it mm-hmm. there isn't an incentive from industries to lobby for a proper tax or mm-hmm. lobby for proper internalization of externalities, you know, well, so the, and this is what makes it so complicated. Exactly. I mean, we do so have to be reasonable and we are responsible too. Why are we just sitting there and accepting this? You know, why are we saying, OK, the only people who need to decide on all of this are brands? You know, it's obviously not the case. So um, step up and 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 be counted. <laughs> and say, well, what, you know, bring bring these other people in because obviously, you know, how many of us have time or know enough to start uh, uh, talking about all of these things? But you have to, if you want to have global legislation, you have got to include the entire globe in your your discussions and in your plans, and you can't just allow one small group. Uh, to decide amongst themselves. Veronica, I uh, got sort of overexcited at the beginning of this conversation and didn't ask you the first question. So I'm going to pose it to you as the penultimate question. No. And I think given the... I the... get away without answering that one. <laughs> <laughs> We've covered a huge amount of sort of technicality here. So I'm very interested in how you will answer it now after, you know, everyone has heard sort of the level of your expertise. But, you know, for you, why is the world in crisis? The world is in crisis because we are consuming too much and the poorest of the planet are consuming too little. And we have uh, absolutely no incentive to change that for all the reasons that we've just been discussing. And as long as we keep pretending that brands setting science-based targets or the EU introducing ESPR is somehow going to help, it's not. You know, nothing is going to change. We have to address the fact that we as individuals in the global north are consuming well above the permitted level. And we have to bring it down. And we have to understand that the people at the bottom of the pile are consuming well under the permitted level, and they have to come up. And until we start getting the, the prices that people are working with, we internalize all of this in market incentives, whether it's the brands looking at the market incentives or whether it's the consumer looking at the market, until it's all internalized in those incentives, absolutely nothing is going to happen. I'm so interested in how people are going to respond to all of this because I think, I think, you know, I think it's right that actually that question didn't come first. I think it's right that it came at the end because I think for a lot of like the planet critical community, um, you know, if you mention the words sort of individual or market incentives, you know, uh, the sort of instinct and also for me as well as to be a bit like, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. That's not really where I, I am in my thinking. And yet to have you laid out sort of all of your your expertise, your knowledge, your suggestions, um, and a really acute analysis as well of what is going wrong. You didn't want to use the word collusion. I will use the word collusion, <laughs> acknowledging that you did not use that word, but the collusion and corruption. <laughs> I think I'm 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 very excited to see how people respond mm. to 
you know, to this sort of final chat on economics after having come through all of this, this detail. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what the audience has to say. My final question for you, because we have to wrap up, is who would you like to platform? I would actually really like you to reach out to some people who produce, you know, like the ISC in, in, in India, the International Sericulture Commission, or trying to reach out to some people who work in alpaca in, in, in Peru, or trying to get hold, I've tried, I've not had any success, trying to get hold of, of someone in Benin Cotton. I've got somebody's name from the sericultural organization because they were a source for that in- investigation. Yes, we're here talking about what we need to do, what we need to we see, everything from our point of view. We're just a tiny fraction of the world population, really. The richest, the most powerful, the most influential. We have a duty to worry about the people who don't have voices. And obviously that's what your podcast does. It gives people voices. I think it'd be really wonderful if you could bring bring some of these, give people a voice. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Take care. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together. 